So there are no shortage of policy areas under the sun mm -hmm. for people to get into here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. You work on education uh, and school choice policy. Yeah. What drew you to that? Part of it is that both of my parents are uh, public school teachers. Um, another part of it is that I actually was homeschooled for the first 10 years of my life, so I kind of have experienced firsthand how um, I have two other siblings, and we all were educated differently under the same roof. Uh, so when I started going to public schools and saw that, wow, we have way more than three people in this building, and we're all kind of being educated in the same way, um, it really was a huge disconnect. Uh, so I've just kind of been interested in like how the education landscape can broaden to accommodate just personal differences. That's a really unique example of a family that went with different things for different children. I, did they see a need that was different with you and your siblings based on what kind of education they gave you? Certainly, yes. Yeah. So my mom actually has a certification in special education, so okay. she understands how individual needs can vary even within a public school context. A lot of that is defined by legal policies at public schools, but she just saw the utility of it. My older brother has some pretty serious ADHD. Um, my little sister is kind of a bookworm. I like to just kind of get everything done, so she would give me a list and I just work on that stuff on my own, uh, whereas the others, they had their different learning models. The battle between advocates of, of public schools and advocates of choice uh, are quite heated, and they often get quite nasty and personal. Mm -hmm. How do you think school choice advocates like yourself and, and your family, which seems to exist sort of on both sides of that spectrum, right. make peace and sort of establish that they're working towards the same thing? I think they need, school choice advocates need to think, keep the focus kind of positive. They need to keep talking about individual students empowering, you know, funding and empowering uh, individual families. Um, that's not to say that public schools have been a, a, a total dismal failure. It's just to say that there's all sorts of uh, education potential and human capital potential that's not captured. Uh, by the current system. I think you can keep the message largely positive while still pushing for reform of the existing uh, institution, even aggressive reform. So keeping the re rhetoric positive, I think, would be central. And I guess on that note, is there sort of a tack that you find to, to not work and be distasteful, particularly when it comes to trying to get everybody on the same side about reforming education to be better for our children? It's a great question. So at times, I think a lot of school choice advocates are misguided in that they talk so much about failing and underperforming public schools and it's quite an kids attack, being yeah. left behind. And you know the fact of the matter is actually a lot of people do have positive public school experiences. So, and a lot of the honestly, a lot of people who hold power they don't even understand yeah. that reality. So, I think it's important to emphasize that things can get better. Point to the overall empirical stuff. Point to the polls that shows actually pretty broad parental support, especially among low-income and disadvantaged families. I think that stuff is more compelling than just kind of attacking the existing institution. Because for a lot of people, they had pub positive public school experiences. Yeah, I like yourself. I kind of did both, or all three, really: mm -hmm. homeschool, private, and uh, and public. And all of them were good experiences. And I, I think that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. um, are there any experiments going on in education? Uh, worldwide or here in the United States that you think are particularly interesting and, and could sort of point to the future of where we might go with education? So right now a lot of the uh, school choice programs throughout the country are, at the United States are focused on low income and disadvantaged kids. I think that's a great start. Uh, but as these programs have really diversified, about half the states in the country have programs like this. Some of those states have three, four, five, like Florida I think has, is up to like five or six at this point. Um, the focus needs to start pivoting more towards broader school choice. So in Florida right now, there's some political um, kind of winds blowing in the direction of getting a universal ESA, which is an education savings account. Mm -hmm. What that would do would give, would give all families access to basically the dollars that would have been spent on their public education, instead portability with those funds to take them to a private school or some kind of education services marketplace. The focus being more broadly on school choice I think is the way of the future because up until now a lot of it has just been about alleviating kind of the poor school experiences of low income and disadvantaged kids. Christian, we've only been sitting for five minutes. I feel like I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Stephen.